please uh, join me in welcome Keolu, who will be our uh, presenter today. Um, he's a Kanaka Maoli, if I pronounce that correctly, and an assistant professor at the University of California in San Diego. Uh, he's affiliated with the Department of Anthropology, the Global Health Program, and the Hali Siogo Data Science Institute, the Climate Action Lab, and the Indigenous Futures Lab. Um, personally, he holds a um, PhD in Genome Sciences from the University of Washington in Seattle, and his multidisciplinary research interests include genome sequencing, genome engineering, computational biology, evolutionary genetics, paleogenetics, and indigenizing biomedical research. His primary research focuses on questions of functionalizing genomics, testing theories of natural selection, by editing genes, and determining the functions of mutations. That is quite a mouthful to say um, for a lawyer, mind you. So um, I think uh, looking at the um, today's topic of our futures, I think that's I think where we are really interested to learn from your experiences and also see where we have the crossovers uh, with Arctic, even though you say uh, you haven't seen snow in a while. But welcome, Kielu. And um, I think, yeah, the floor is yours. And um, for everyone else, please, uh, again, as usual, uh, type your questions in the chat and I'll be happy to moderate them to Kielu after this talk. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Many of those words, uh, I can't even pronounce myself. So that is just so impressive. Um, but it's so lovely to be here and talk to you about my work, which really centers in the Pacific. But I think that, again, I, I said this, you know, briefly, but I, I think that it, a lot of the ideas and the way we, we treat data and people mostly in communities is very portable to a lot of the work that all of you do. And so without wasting any more time, I will share my thing. And I hope you guys can, can yep, see that we can see it. Okay. Oh, good. Can you hear me? Well, perfectly fine. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna start from here from the top. And All right, that should work good. Okay, <clears throat> so I've entitled this uh, talk or lecture. It's gonna be about 45 minutes to an hour, depends on how long, uh, I hope that's okay. Is that too long or is that? I mean, we, we've scheduled in an hour, um, for also for the exchange and talk. So uh, maybe we'll just see how many questions pop in on the side and maybe you get to answer some of those along the way. But, okay. So, um, so 45 minutes is perfectly fine, thanks. All right, I will. I will expedite certain parts and, and focus on, on others. But <clears throat> I've entitled this Missing Sequences, Why Just Increasing Diversity in Genome Science is Not Enough. Now, a lot of my work is centered on not just sequencing diverse communities of people's genomes, but empowering them and creating vertical stacks of technology to truly enable capacity building. So it's one thing to have a indigenous student from, I don't know, Tahiti or Greenland attend school at Harvard or Stanford or University of Washington or Georgetown, but it's another thing to build the technologies locally. And it's quite difficult. And we're going to talk about why that is for a number of reasons. I think many of you are familiar with building infrastructure in many of these places. And Anyway, somebody's in the kitchen. But uh, so, <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the primer for this. I am at the University of California, San Diego in La Jolla, actually. And we have an intense focus on climate change, climate, the climate crisis, a lot of the technologies that have been used to measure many of these things at Scripps Institute for Oceanography, I'm sure you're, many of you guys are familiar with. And we also work very closely with our global health program, the medical school, and our new Indigenous Futures Institute. Um, check that out. I'll explain a little bit more about what that is and what we're focused on there, but it's, it's very exciting. And we have a range of different projects that we're working on. <clears throat> My family, though, is originally from this really, really isolated place in the middle of the Pacific. This is kind of an update on my mo'oku auhau, or my genealogy, my relationship to the place where we're from. And it's zeroed in on the big island of Hawaii in this valley here on the northern tip. And it's one of the most very beautiful places I've ever been. Um, but 
it's a very interesting place to be exposed to and think about many, many different things that have to do with biology and natural selection and diversity. It's one of the very most diverse places on planet Earth in terms of the flora and fauna. It's also the extinction capital of the world and the invasive species capital of the world. So it gets you thinking about many of these ideas that have to do with diversity and genomics and imperialism and colonialism and all of the different efforts and people that are trying to build capacity um, on top of Mauna Kea, for example. We have all of these different telescopes, none of which are really owned and governed by native Hawaiian people. It's the Subaru telescope from those, that's the Japanese one, the new TMT that's coming from Caltech and, and um, Harvard and the Smithsonian, et cetera. So you get the picture, right? We're seeing these, these research outposts spring up and they speak to creating data for community, for, for the scientific community broadly, but we have to ask larger questions about what the impact is for our communities first. Um, <clears throat> currently though, I work at the University of California, San Diego. It is a special place because it is perennially rated the number one institution in the world by Surfer Magazine every single year. And we're very stoked about that. It's lovely. It's a little cold right now. You need the wetsuit. You guys are familiar with that. But <clears throat> given the, the climate and the ecosystem of science, this is one of the very best places in the world to focus on genome sequencing, genome technology development. We have an exceptional medical school. We have a diverse community of people. And the ocean is stunning and beautiful. Surfing and diving is wonderful. So it's a great place to work. So if anybody is interested in, in collaborating or coming for some kind of residency through our Indigenous Futures Institute, we're, all, <laughs> we're all always we're always looking to recruit people and we have a really strong focus on uh, the climate crisis currently. So um, my lab though focuses on a few different things. I'm gonna talk about safeguarding ancient and Indigenous genomics and DNA. I'll talk about functionally investigating just so stories. This is basically a CRISPR-Cas9 plug where we're using something called base editing to reverse engineer mutations in, in sort of unique ways. And then we'll talk about building more equitable systems for managing the health data of indigenous people. So we'll start with the first one. The first one is inspired by the recent explosion in ancient genomics research. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're thinking about and what we're doing. Um, first and foremost, I'm not a Luddite. I love all forms of genomic data, including ancient genome information. This is our most recent paper. We published this in the Journal of Molecular Biology and Evolution through Oxford University. And we are using ancient genomic information and modern genomic information from modern contemporary populations of people to predict the ABO blood types of both Neanderthals. And we asked this question about something called intergression which is the idea that modern populations inherit small segments of DNA from ancient archaic populations. So we can play this comparative mathematics game and we can actually de determine uh, the duality of, of, of that relationship. And it's very fun to do things like this and assess, you know, the, and think about why we're here and they're not and what their immune systems might have looked like or what their brains might have looked like and functioned like, and so on and so forth. And so it's been a very rich and fertile um, new avenue in genomics and genomic technology development. And all this data is freely available. Um, so all of that is to say that there have just been these tremendous insights that we've gained. Um, first of all, the fact that we did interbreed and were intimate with Neanderthals. So, you know, think about, think about that for a moment, but the, the idea that we can actually speculate on that in some major new ways is just tremendous, okay? <clears throat> Feel free to ask questions about that uh, um, later. Um, so thinking about this space of ancient genomics, we entered in this competition at MIT called MIT Solve, and we put together a project and a team focusing on safeguarding ancient DNA, and I'll tell you why. 
Um, this is our team. It's super multidisciplinary, number of different people focusing on different things. Um, we have a lawyer, various archaeologists, computer scientists. Um, this gentleman is also from Berlin. He's a um, an AI ethicist. We have a number number of kind of interesting people. This gentleman is an excellent surfer and indigenous uh, in indigenous politics. So you get the picture. Diverse team. Um, as a kid, I, I was always in love with Indiana Jones until I learned about imperialism and colonialism because I, I didn't put it together. It's, there's still some of my most favorite movies, but I never put it together in the sense of like, this is harmful and potentially detrimental to different communities. And how do things end up in museums in the first place, right? I, I think these are some major questions that people are still grappling with. And we're seeing this birth and new focus on, wait a minute, how did the, the British Museum acquire the Elgin marbles and the Benin bronzes and so on and so on and so forth. Now those are physical, kind of, kind of physical artifacts, but sometimes artifacts are ancestors. You know, we find different ways to integrate our hair and bones and other things into art. And that art can then be acquired on Sotheby's, for example, or something like this, and that contains DNA, which contains our genealogy, which also contains an indigenous community's intimate relationship with a specific geography for tens of thousands of years. It might even be medically actionable. This character though, Indiana Jones, is based off of this man, Hiram Bingham III. He was a Hawaiian resident. He was a looter. He was a grave robber. He was a tomb raider. He famously stole a whole bunch of ancient remains from Incan communities in the 1900s, the early 1900s, and they ended up at the Yale Peabody Museum. I bring him up because this is the actual character, again, that, you know, Indiana Jones was based off of. And this begs the question, how do many of these remains end up in cold steel drawers and dusty boxes and warehouses all over the world. What are the, the term that people in museum studies like to use is provenance. What is the provenance or the origin of an artifact or an ancestor and how did it get there? And why are we trading these remains around like baseball cards? Um, and I think there is a lot of accountability and culpability that's going on in this space right now but it's an interesting environment to think about how to improve the process. How do we create transparency um, and, and responsibility? <clears throat> so we'll talk about that. Um, but in that sense, like the, the anthropology of the past, these ideas about human measurement, anthropometry and phrenology and measuring eye color and the kinkiness of hair and, and these types of ideas, they're not that different than the anthropology of today and the population genetics of today, where we, if you're squeamish around uh, human bones, um, kind of tune back in in five minutes. But the, the, I think these, this duality, this idea, they're, they're not different. They're, they're the same. It's just the tools we're using are different. Here we see a bone drill used to create bone dust, which then is ran through a next generation sequencing library prep protocol and sequenced on a next generation sequencer. That data now becomes part of the big data economy. It becomes something that's comparable, it becomes part of this apparatus, which is the number one resource on planet earth. But none of this process involved consensus building with communities. At the very least, it probably involved some paperwork that allowed the investigators to acquire authorization. So there's a huge difference in the way we co-design projects with communities and then the way that we seek authorization. And I think that is like very obvious for us in medicine and ancient genomics and genomics broadly, but it's also very obvious in the ways that we think about surveying land, thinking about land tenure and many, many other things that you guys probably go through with your own work um, as it relates to the Arctic and, and uh, many, many other things. So just wanted to put that into perspective. It leads us to this new position, which isn't new at all, actually. And it's, is ancient DNA research revealing new truths or is it falling into old traps? 
And that's something that we should be thinking about because if we're just creating new data sets that aren't allowing, that aren't question driven, they aren't allowing us to actually create new questions um, and provide solutions for those things. And why are we doing them for the first place in the first place? Um, yeah. Um, we published this piece that was in the journal Nature and it is and was really fun to write. And, it, and what we showed is that more ancient genomes have been sequenced in 2019 than in the entirety of history. There is this acceleration and this explosion, this bone bonanza, this bone rush that is going on currently. And it is not involving community members from indigenous communities. It is involving academic institutions, museum curators, and many, many others that we're gonna talk about. So it's problematic. Um, additionally, more ancient DNA labs have been constructed in, in uh, since 2010 than, you know, I mean, for example, this, this piece and map that I published in the SAA record shows that in blue, we have DNA, ancient DNA workflows that existed prior to 2010 and then in red, we can see afterwards, right? And we even have some in, up here in Alaska. Um, and not all of these are focused on human DNA, but it begs the question, when you create more lab workflows, they require uh, more ancient DNA and remains to be processed at an exponential scale. Um, look no further than Christie's, Sotheby's, Instagram, eBay as thriving marketplaces where ancient remains are sold to the highest bidder. This is again, highly problematic because we're not creating accountability in these situations and scenarios. The laws that are supposed to protect ancient remains don't do a very good job of that. Something like NAGPRA, for example, only has jurisdiction in the United States of America. Um, and it doesn't protect hair or teeth, which both contain DNA. So what we've been doing is taking more of a counter technologies or deterrent technology approach. And so we've said, okay, well, we need to create accountability. And, and in doing that, we can use technologies like ledger systems or blockchain to incorporate and link together CT scans, weight, timestamps, and many, many other forms of metadata to actually understand who is accessing what, where, when, and why, and who has uh, remains, and where have they been, and what is the, the sort of amount of time that they've been there, and how much have they destroyed, and what are negative results, and you can collect and aggregate all of this data. So when you hear blockchain, you probably think of cryptocurrency, but that's not the case. Um, it's being used in a number of different ways, and I think we're only starting to scratch the surface of what its potential is in terms of creating accountability. Certainly in the ancient genomic space, it's serving as this major deterrent technology. It's kind of like having an ADT sign in your yard when you don't even pay for ADT, right? If you know the data is on the blockchain, you're less likely to do um, criminal things with it and violate human rights and indigenous rights. Um, another thing we're using is something called computer vision, which is a form of machine learning. In genomics, we were doing machine learning before it was cool. And so we apply this in a bunch of unique ways with the data sets that we have available. For example, we can acquire images from something like Instagram or videos and turn them into stills. And then we can train a data set and analyze those images based on the number of aggregated images. And we can score them based on the pixelization. And we can say, all right, if I look for human skulls on Instagram, what do I see? And based on the asymmetry, for example, or various um, variables and characteristics, we can zero in on individuals who, in, in, a, in a high throughput fashion, on individuals who are being involved in the trade of ancient remains online. So my collaborators, uh, Sean Graham and Damian Huffer have been really good at this and they've aggregate, aggregate and I apologize, these are uh, human remains. Many of them are real, many of them are not. And it allows us to kind of zero in on networks of people that are actually 
searching and tr trading and involved in the illicit trade of remains online. Um, and here are some of the things that have been found. Um, again, you can go into the actual comment sections and you can see the way that people are brokering deals. And man, if you told me that I was going to be a genome scientist and we would be work working on and focusing on deterrent technologies like this, I, I would have told you that you're crazy, but it works. And again, it serves to create accountability because no one should be trading people's ancestors online for money. That's weird. So um, all of that is to say the technologies that we're designing, and these aren't all of them, they're just a handful that I wanted to kind of show you guys. They are a part of this much larger movement within the decolonial museum settings um, scenario. And these are Benin bronzes that are slated to be returned to uh, Benin uh, from the British Museum. It's pretty exciting. It's part of this much larger movement and we're excited to be focusing on those ideas. Um, myself and Jillian and Leah here at the Bishop Museum started this, look at this, how auspicious is that? On our opening day for this, we get a rainbow. No, there's rainbows every day in Hawaii. But, uh, but we started Regenerations, Challenging Scientific Racism in Hawaii, where we created a museum exhibit that is so it was solely focused on rec reconciling and understanding the effects of eugenic research in Hawaii at the Bishop Museum. So turning the Bishop Museum in on itself and working very closely with families on archival evidence that we have done. So I want you guys to understand like how sensitive this shit is. It is so hard to create a museum exhibit that focuses on recognizing and challenging scientific racism. Like we could have fucked this up a thousand different ways, but because we co-designed the exhibit with families that are the descendants of people that were actually included in this, it was a huge success because we iterated over what the content should be over time. And it's only been there about a month now and it has had critical acclaim. We've already had press and you name it, the New York Times, et cetera. And I think that it's unique. It speaks to the local complexities of scientific racism in Hawaii. And we didn't design this for, for uh, you know, Tim, who's coming from Kansas to play golf in Maui. We designed this exhibit for our people to celebrate our people and to challenge racism in a direct way and build community around that. Um, and build fluency around genomic technologies and other things as we move into the future. So if you're in Hawaii and Honolulu over the next year, please go check it out. Tell them you know me and they'll give you free uh, uh, access to the museum. Um, you know, in the end, just wrapping up this section, you know, in Hawaii, we have been indigenous futurists forever. We had colored newspaper well before anyone in the world we had electricity in Iolani Palace before the White House. We will always use the best technologies available to support and empower our culture and our community. And that's what we continue to do at the Indigenous Futures Institute. Okay, so secondly, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about CRISPR-Cas9 and using this to um, challenge narratives that come out around population genetics. And I wanna explain what I mean, because this stuff's a totally different direction then I apologize uh, to drag you guys around like that, but it's fun. Background. Genomics, broadly, you know, human genetics and sequencing experiments have mostly over time since 2005 exclusively featured individuals of European ancestry. And here we can see that um, in many different genome studies. This is problematic because one, well, as we build precision medicine and medicine and predictive and preventative medicine of the future, we're not including every single population. Every algorithm becomes biased because we train everything on one data set, right? So we, we have to confront that issue and legitimately ask questions about why that's happening. But it also allows for the generation of something called just so stories. So all my principles of evolution nerds that are here are probably familiar with this idea, but I'm a huge fan of this famous paper that came out through the Royal Society Proceedings B, and it was a paper, 
uh, from two incredible evolutionary scholars. One of them is the, by the name of Stephen Jay Gould. The other one was Richard Lewinton. And they said that a lot of the ways people narrativize their data is what's called adaptionism. And he compared it to this book from Roger Kipling who wrote the Jungle Book, but he also wrote this children's book. And in the children's book, you can see on the cover here, there's an elephant that's getting its, you know, uh, trunk tugged on by a crocodile. And this is like the explanation that Roger Kipling gives to say that that's why elephants' noses are so long. Not millions of years of evolution, but because of this instance, right? It's very Lamarckian, if you're familiar with that idea. And this idea of adaptionism is quite rampant throughout biology. And we love to sell those stories and we love to sort of link together these, these narratives in the context of natural selection, right? Charles Darwin style, Russell Wallace style, right? So that is highly problematic when it comes to the way we interpret data that is collected from human populations. So what do I mean? Well, there are a number of examples that you might have heard of. Who's heard of sickle cell? Anyone? Put your hand up, sickle cell anemia. Really? Dang. Okay. All right. Okay, good. We have a few people who've heard of sickle cell. Sickle cell is really interesting because it's usually found uh, in populations that are from equatorial Africa. And the reason it exists and why it's such an A plus story in terms of the way in which geography and infectious disease has shaped our genomes over time uh, is because of the exposure to the malaria parasite because red blood cells know that if they sickle inward, they create less surface area. Less surface area means that the malaria parasite cannot basically procreate and gestate over time, which is what it wants to do. So it's this evolutionary mechanism to combat that. There's a consequence though, you get anemia, meaning you can carry less oxygen. Okay, that is an A plus story. We discover it, we understand that this malaria parasite has shaped red cell biology and physiology over time. And it is specific to the populations that exist at that geography, right? That is what an actual adaptive trait is. Um, that exact mutation in this gene, HBB, has been reverse engineered using CRISPR-Cas9 and it causes the sickling to occur. It's A plus. It's been correlatively identified and it's been causatively mechanistically investigated. That is about as good as, that's the, the, the gold standard. There are many others. ABO, for example, one of my favorite genes in the human genome, did my whole PhD on this thing. It is really, really unique and interesting. It's under another form of natural selection called balancing selection. I'm just, kind of painting you the picture that our genomes and human beings and the physiological differences that you observe, like skin color, hair kinkiness, eye color, all of these traits, we're no different than Darwin's finches. But we've created human exceptionalism to think that we are. But there are many, many, many examples that explain our intimate relationship with geography. So when people in Hawaii say, that mountain is my ancestor. Mauna Kea is my ancestor. We're not fucking around. Like the, it, this, it, this is our evidence here. If I have to show you that data with genome sequence data, I will. But we have literally have this intimate relationship with geography. That's all humans, everyone over time. And that is why we have differences. And those evolutionary differences, they're not any, any different than what's medically actionable either, right? We create these two canons where like one's an evolutionary question and the other is a medical question. They're, they're the same thing, okay. So painting that picture for everyone. Nothing has been more profound in shaping our genomes over time than infectious disease. Look at COVID, another example of that. That's why we have immunological diversity. The, the rest of the story I'm going to tell you is about this gene right here, CREBRF. A specific mutation is discovered in Samoa in 2015 that looks like it predisposes to obesity, 
but protects against type 2 diabetes, which is nuts. I did a rotation in endocrinology um, back in 2017. And one of the things we learn is there's a linear correlation between type 2 diabetes and obesity. As one goes up, so does the other, right? Statistically, mathematically. But you would never expect to see a genetic mutation that predisposes to obesity, but protects against type 2 diabetes. That's very interesting from the physiological point of view. It's interesting from the evolutionary point of view. And it's definitely interesting if you're Pfizer, Merck, GSK, et cetera, right? OK, so let's dig in. The just so claim, though, about this is very interesting because the authors say that this is a gene that, again, is found in people who are obese. I don't know if you've ever been to Polynesia or Samoa, but these are some of the largest human beings on planet Earth. Like, we come in XL plus. That's it. Really. And so saying that this mutation is thrifty is problematic. That goes back to this history of 1950s uh, evolutionary adaptionism saying, okay, there's mutations that we discover in certain populations that look like they predispose to obesity because of a number of reasons. And the evolutionary narrative they use is highly problematic. They say that the selective force that maintained this thrifty allele in Polynesia is related to the scarcity of calories during our diaspora. They mean our voyaging accomplishments. So this is highly problematic because that means that you're saying that there were problems with caloric levels as you travel from one location to the other and seek to identify all of these island nations like Hawaii, Tahiti, Samoa, Aotearoa, Rapa Nui, etc. And we just know that's not true. But the media loves this, right? So they say this is the gene that may benefit sumo giants and how a powerful obesity gene has shaped Samoans and helped us, you know, conquer the Pacific. So this creates a lot of issues because when we actually look at our diaspora, we didn't have an innate advantage. We utilize science, not indigenous science, not Western science, science. Don't, don't create a hierarchy. That's not how it works. We're making observations. We're using ecological metadata like bird migration patterns to find land. The green glint on the bottom of a cloud where you have uh, light reflecting from a lagoon onto the bottom of a cloud, right? That's how we orient ourselves, currents, um, bioluminescence at, at night. And then when it gets dark, that's when we really get busy because we utilize the celestial sphere for navigation. And we're the greatest ever at this. It's not even negotiable. It's not negotiable. So in the end, it's very obvious to us as horticulturalists who brought taro and brought sweet potato and brought chicken and brought pig with us on our journey, we did not have a problem with scarcity of calories. Have you ever been fishing with a Polynesian person? It's always fish on. It's all, always hanapa. We don't fish, we catch fish. So of course we're catching fish along the way. So what I'm trying to say is that you can't blame this mutation that you find and create an evolutionary narrative around scarcity of calories because that wasn't a thing that didn't happen you're also discrediting our voyaging accomplishments and and just contextually i'm trying to get everybody to understand the way we make data fit a model and make a model fit data and create an evolutionary narrative but making matters even more complicated is that we do have really high rates of obesity in polynesia we have issues around you know our land tenure and our ocean tenure so we don't have access to the fields that we need for sweet potato and taro so we replace that with white rice spam and soy sauce and the kind of residue and hangover of colonialism and so we we do have these major problems so that kind of muddies the water mathematically and statistically when you're thinking about the epidemiology and, and, and and that sort of thing that's going on. Um, this mutation isn't just found in Samoa. We follow up and we find out that it's exclusively found in Polynesia. And then we find out 
that it's not even just found in Polynesia, that the boundary that we've created between Polynesia and Micronesia is also a myth, that these categories don't actually exist. Because how can it be in Guam, in the Chamorro, and also be in Hawaii? So I think the more time you spend there, you can say there's a lot of similarities between Hawaiians and Tahitians. There are, you know, they're just a little uglier than us. But no, I'm teasing. But but I, but what I'm trying to get at is that <laughs> there's a there's a ubiquity. There's a there's a cultural transmission. We share our genomes. You can't separate things geographically in the Pacific the way that scientists intend to. The ocean connects us. It doesn't separate us. Right. And we see that in the data. It's all about the way you interpret it. So the frequencies of these mutations show us how connected we are, not how separated we are. OK. Luckily for us, though, we're some genome editing Hawaiians. So we take this mutation to task and we say, OK, you say it's thrifty. We say that in 2021 and 2020, we can actually reverse engineer this in a stem cell in a cellular system using something called base editing. And that's something that Alexis Comor, who was my PhD advisor, or my, sorry, postdoc advisor at, at the University of California developed. And so we did just that. We utilized this catalytically inactive Cas9 and we went into a cell line and we introduced this specific quote unquote thrifty mutation. And that's what this looks like. And it's pretty cool to do this. These are called Sanger sequencing traces. This is an unedited cell line. This is an edited cell line. This is the introduction of the mutation. This is the exon or protein coding region in which the mutation lives. And we were able to reverse engineer it here. And we did it for extremely cheap. We did it for under $600 when this would cost you if you worked with a one of these other companies, not gonna name names, probably 20 to 25 grand for a knock in cell line. So we're very happy about this. And we're taking this approach with many different mutations. How about high elevation mutations in genes like EPAS1 that are discovered in the Himalayas? What about the Andes? What about mutations that are um, predisposing communities of people in Polynesia to gout? What about mutations that only exist in Neanderthals? Can you bring those into cell lines that, right? Oh, now we're having fun with reverse engineering and this game of reverse genetics that was actually created in the 1950s. So I don't want you guys to think like we're that cool, like people have done this, but they haven't done it with this precision because the tools weren't available to do that. And it's super portable for all types of different cell lines, fat tissue, liver tissue, brain tissue. Is this actually the complete story of what's going on? No, but it's a start. And we're getting there. Um, you know, this story also kind of takes a dark turn because investigators that initially identified this mutation who are not from a Moana country attempted to file a patent claim around this mutation because of its medical actionability. And they attempt to commercialize the exclusive physiological use of this. And that's highly concerning because that shows you that genetic information as a resource is no different than oil or timber or diamonds or cobalt. And we need to act quickly around creating, you know, literacy around what's going on and what the value of your genome is and knowing that it is a resource and it should be protected and we should control who accesses it. Because when we make arguments around the greater good, the real question is, who's greater good? Is it our greater good or is it Pfizer's greater good? Um, and obviously things are really complex because we're seeing the success of something like a, a, a Pfizer vaccine or a Moderna vaccine. Um, just everyone who's here, uh, you know, that's a huge accomplishment, mRNA technology. This, this is a, a huge leap forward in terms of the way we we, we've, we perform vaccination, but that doesn't mean that there aren't tons of people making a lot of cash because there are, and that money should be more equally distributed. Um, in addition to that, you know, this is already going on. If you haven't read the age of surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, it was amazing. It was like my 2019 book of the year. 
it kind of describes the big data economy in a really intimate, nuanced way. And genomic information from humans or bacteria or flora or fauna fall very nicely into this new form of capitalism. And I think it's worth reading and checking out. Um, finally, I'll just talk and leave you guys with a few more ideas about building equitable health systems and indigenous data sovereignty. Um, we put out this paper in Nature Genetics. Check it out. It's basically about rights, interests, and expectations and indigenous perspectives on unrestricted and open access to data. This has been highlighted and brought to the forefront through the COVID-19 pandemic and, and strengthening the push for indigenous data control, because now people are starting to realize how valuable data is. This is a piece uh, in Wired. It was really good by Kaylin Goodluck. He's kind of an up and coming superstar native journalist. So check him out. And that data is being used to revolutionize drug therapy. For example, there are many different new drugs that are coming out from companies like Regeneron, where they know that if they stack the deck for diverse populations, they're going to find interesting mutations, which allow them to reverse engineer biomarkers that can be turned into synthetic versions of this and so on and so forth. Um, and this has already happened with a new class of cholesterol drugs that were, you know, the insights for this were derived from African and African American communities. There's also Vertex. This is a drug that was derived using genome sequence data from cystic fibrosis patients. And then it was sold back to them for $300,000 a year. In my opinion, this is a violation of the common rule. This should never happen in our country where we have estimated 30 million people, between 30 and 60 million people who at any given time don't have access to healthcare. We need to think about more equitable ways to uh, design drugs and for people to have access to drugs. But 300,000 a year is not a way to do that. Um, speaking to that, I published this piece in the New England Journal of Medicine about approaches to equitable benefit sharing. This is just the idea that we need to create circular ex economic structures around the intellectual property and royalties that are derived from the development of blockbuster drugs. And there are many ways to do this. There are collective interest models. You can also think about individual interests, fractional ownership or stockholding models. Airbnb did this. 23andMe is about to go public. That means that all of the drugs that they're designing are based off of the database of people who graciously provided their genomes in order for them to create new autoimmune disorder drugs. Blackstone Group just acquired Ancestry DNA for $4.7 billion. This information is worth a lot of money. And when you plug it into converging data and analytics and modeling systems, it's even more valuable. That's what they're paying for access, you, right? That's why these companies are valued so much. So we need to ensure that our communities get a larger piece of the pie through benefit sharing models. We can do this by use, utilizing a number of these technologies that we've talked about. One of them is really cool and it's been in the news quite a bit uh, and they're called data trusts. And like any other trusts, these are ways to share data in an equitable way and ensure that they are controlled and secure. Um, this is a paper that was published in Cell last month. It's really interesting because they talk about shells of data sharing, public asset access, institutional access, and so on, and then data generation, preparation, and data discovery. You can imagine incorporating a lot of these other sort of metadata and blockchain systems to understand who's accessing data when, where, and why. Is blockchain good for the environment? And computation, that's a whole nother question um, that we can talk about uh, later. Um, but a lot of these other institutions and places are already thinking about this in major ways. The UN, the World Economic Forum, the Atlantic Council is a great place to learn about these things. Um, the the, yeah, they're also part of the UN, but just broadly thinking about all of the new forms of data management and consensus building um, through these sort of living and iterative big data ecosystems. It's going to be a lot of fun in the future, and I feel like it has the potential to empower many of our communities. So lastly, um, 
ethics is really important. It's not an afterthought. It's the origin or the pico, the gestating seed of which every project should be developed. This is a paper we published in Nature Communications around these ideas and issues. There's, ooh, whoops, no substitute for grassroots research. This is a convening that we had around metabolic health in Ahipada, Aotearoa, or New Zealand. Um, democratizing technology is essential. This is my friend Hayden Henry doing his first P, uh, PCR. He's in his 50s. He's a giant human being. This XXL lab coat didn't even fit him. That to me is symbolic of the way science has been designed. It hasn't been inclusive of our communities. I just love this picture. He's having so much fun. He's an amazing person. Um, and we put on the Sing Indigenous Genomics Conference. This is the first Indigenous indig uh, conference um, with all Indigenous speakers speaking to many different things in Waikato, Aotearoa. Um, algorithm fairness, which we talked about, is super essential for reducing bias. Including vulnerable populations in the assessment of data always makes for better project development. Remapping the human genome is essential because we know the map that we use to compare every other genome to is derived from Western European ancestry. So it privileges that sort of diversity. And that means that we're introducing all of these new forms of embedded bias that are baked in and we, we can't even think about it. We also have used approaches to create population specific reference genomes and discovered new human genes that had never been seen before. This is work from Evan Eichler's group at University of Washington. This is truly remarkable because if you think about how much bias there is, these genes had been present for how long? And no one had seen them before because of this, this bias that exists. So that's another avenue for development. Solidarity between our communities. This is uh, some of the efforts that we're working on for our Oceanic Genomics Consortia. And in the end, more indigenous futurism and thinking about how to use those ideas. And thank you so much. And I'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Kiru. That was absolutely fascinating. And join me in a round of applause. Um, yeah, downright amazing. I'm always amazed by how much I learn from, from individuals such as you. Um, every new slide gave me a new idea of something I never thought about before. So that was absolutely uh, mind blowing. And um, I think, uh, welcome back, Victoria, of course. Uh, I had a hiccup with my internet connection, uh, so I blanked out there for two minutes. Um, but I think there was a question at the very beginning um, that was focusing on the, you know, is it is it the obtaining that is that is um, sort of the problematic issue, or is it also the use? And, and maybe the person, uh, which is not my chat anymore, unfortunately, because it was kicked out. Um, maybe you can ask your question directly to Keolu. Yeah, um, thanks. Sasha, please, great, yes. Great, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so it was it was more um, thinking about your blockchain research um, and thinking about how um, this um, DNA sequences are, are being used and how that is uh, a criminal act. So I think you, you outlined pretty well that um, just obtaining this information is, is cr a criminal act and, and should be, um, th this genetic information should be in the hands of these indigenous communities. But do you see in the currently or in the future any, any risk of how this information will be used nefariously either um, using ancestral bones to sequence um, genomes and then figure out which genomes might be profitable to sell them? Or how do you see that happening in the future? I Okay, these are, this is a great question. So first, um, the acquiring phase, let's say, because there's not like a pipe line of events that are going on right like there's if you think about it there are whew, where do we even start but you you have how individuals acquire ancient remains right so that could be through an archaeological excavation that could be through um, a museum collection or something like this and there's all, people cut corners in various ways and they 
um, pay people off and they seek authorization versus consensus building, or they illegally ship things from one location to another without the permits that they required because they didn't go through the correct type of regulation. Um, this is much, much harder to do in America because we have NAGPRA. And so we can always point to that. And so there's that thing that's going on. And then there's the idea. So there are all kinds of like legal corners that are cut and rights of, you know, human right violations and things like this. But then there's the, the latter part is like, once that data is created, what is it used to do? So let me give you an example. There is a lay made of human hair that we featured in our exhibit. And it is made from the hair of Queen Emma, who is directly related to King Kamehameha, right? So in Hawaii, we have very strict rules about blood quantum and those, I mean, and blood quantum is such a racist, horrible system, but it's the system that exists in a lot of native communities when it comes to land tenure, because all of our land was <laughs> illegally taken. So uh, now you put that data in the hands of someone that gets to determine what blood quantum is. And then they can now <laughs> determine where you stay on, a, on like the, homestead land list, which is basically our equivalent of reservation land. So it's like this nasty surveillance system of control, because if you don't determine what blood quantum is and someone else does, then that means that you don't get access to land. And then that land is allocated and used for something else. So um, I'm just throwing out scenarios in which that could be used. Let's think about other ways that it could be used though. Now, we're having conversations about actually deriving ancient, constructing and assembling ancient human genomes from soil, from like meters away from the actual remains. And that is possible. And it's truly a remarkable science, scientific and technological feat. But it now, it, it now shows you that we can use non-invasive surveillance technologies to do the same things. And really it's about what is the value of the data that's derived. It's the desecration of remains is one thing, but the data and that is a commodity and what it's used to do is, is, is crazy. And then, okay, to make matters even more complicated because we're just playing the, I kind of painted you guys an incomplete picture on purpose and here's why. There's ancient genomes and then there's modern genomes, but I told you at the top of the talk, we like to compare them. But what if I can start looking at time cross sections? I can say, I see a reduction in HLA over time. I can show you the effect of colonialism on the genome. We're doing this. This has already been done in a, a paper with SK Villerslev from um, Copenhagen and uh, Ripon Mali. And they show by comparing an ancient genome from a Metcatla community from British Columbia to uh, the modern population they can show that there's a reduction in HLA after European arrival because of a population collapse of 80%, right? So we can physically, empirically do tons of things with the immune system and other things and connect that directly to health disparities that exist today. But you see how different me using the data as a Hawaiian man is, is a, a different question, right? I'm gonna show you a different way to use the data. I mean, and that's, that's what we seamlessly do at Indigenous Futures Institute. It's like, you're using the data set, I'm using the data set, but I'm using it in a different way because I have a different question. I'm just trying to like play devil's advocate, but also empower our communities because if we don't use the data that way, then it just, we, we continue to like propagate these false narratives. Like we're gonna reduce health disparities using genomics. Like I've said that in a hundred different grants cause I need the money, but I know that we have way more basic issues like fresh water access and land tenure and food justice and all kinds of other shit. So uh, that's kind of a long winded way of answering your very good question with a lot more complexity. 
Thanks, Caitlin. I think you sparked another round of uh, three or four more questions on this. Of but um, maybe I'll, I'll read you one of the questions from Nicholas. I think he had to run, uh, unfortunately, but he joined us in saying this is a wildly fascinating presentation. Thanks. I was hoping you could just share your thoughts on the role CRISPR will play as we move into a future with high viral rent diseases, uh, biodiversity loss and climate change. How can CRISPR serve good ends as capitalism continues generating scarcity and disaster? Also, that is probably... Um, <laughs> the source for another week of lectures, but um, yeah. <laughs> maybe you'll solve on CRISPR. Yeah. yeah, so we're doing an IGI workshop lecture series at um, with um, Jennifer Dudna's team, and it's all about genome editing and the climate crisis. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So I've been thinking about these ideas a lot, actually, because the truth is, um, we focus so much on humans and human genomes because the money's there, right? Every people are going to die, so there's their NIH budget is substantially larger than the NSF budget, almost double, I think. No, way more. Okay, point is it shouldn't be, but I, right. So that kind of speaks to where we're putting our money and and so on and so forth. But I think it's going to be tremendous. But I think it's also super dangerous. Gene drive research is terrifying. I mean, everybody is trying to test their shit on islands, right? They haven't drawn the parallel that like Bikini Atoll was a fucking disaster. And you know what I mean? Like they don't see the parallels between why people always want to use islands as laboratories. Um, and it's really, really frustrating on our end, because as I said, we're the invasive capital of the world, right? So we could point to anything and say, I don't know, Coral health, they're going extinct. Let's um, use a gene drive to make them pH resistant or more robust in, at, at a higher temperature, right? And you can defy the, you know, Mendel's laws by using Cas9 as a mechanism to do this. We could genome edit bacteria and cloud seed, right? And that might have some effect in terms of healing our temporarily healing our our atmosphere. But I, and I could throw out a million different ideas and ways that we can do this. And we're just a, adjusting these systems of control because we've already fucked stuff up with other systems of control, right? It's like it's not the situation you want to be in, but it's also kind of like our inevitable reality because people don't, they, they can't control themselves. They want immediate gratification. They have to fly in a G5 rather than um, a blimp or whatever. You get what I'm saying? Like there's this, this like, we always think that we have to like resort to these, you know, technological determinism rather than changing our lifestyles. I think that's the major problem. Is CRISPR gonna provide some um, innovation, innovative ways to combat this stuff. I, I think it will. And I think like some really great minds are focusing on this, but the, I think the greater question is like, man, why do we have to do that? You know? But, Very full point. And uh, thanks so much. Sorry, didn't want to interrupt you. Please. Oh no, I was going to say there's a, I just finished Elizabeth Colbert's new book under the white sky. And she kind of talks about some of these ideas but the genome, the the gene drive stuff is is it is so potent. It literal, if that goes wrong, you know, I mean, I you you can't even think about what the unintended consequences of that are. I mean, it's just so. Anyway, sorry. But. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Just looking at the time, I think we have another. Uh question or two questions rather by Susanna. Um, Susanna, if you want to go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for this talk. It's a lot of stuff that's I'm vaguely familiar with the genome side, but the connections, the climate crisis and everything are really fascinating. So lots to follow through for me and I'm really excited about that. So I have two questions. The first is really simple. The museum that you mentioned in Honolulu, is that material available online? Do you know whether they've whether you've done anything with COVID and making that accessible for those of us who, I don't know, but okay, excellent. Um, yeah. Second, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I'll okay. do the second I was gonna say the second question, I was just wondering whether you can speak a little bit more about uh, relation to location. 
Yeah. So you're talking a yeah. little bit about sort of human exceptionalism and ancestral mountains. I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit more to location. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah, great question. The second one um, that is like, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. First, uh, the exhibit, the physical exhibit, we designed and made it COVID friendly. So you don't have to touch anything. Um, we have like this one thing where you use a bio, it's like a, a infrared sensor where you can, you know, move a cursor on a map and things like this so that people don't have to touch anything. Um, they are creating the online materials right now. And I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Obviously, it's not going to be the same thing, you know, but it's still cool. The building is so cool, though. I mean, it's such an ancient building. Like, you guys have to go and see it in, in real life because it's a whole different feel. And then the second question, speaking to, like, local complexities, I'm trying to transition every single project that we work on so that it reflects that, like local complexities, um, um, whether it's architecture, urban planning, hospitals of the future, the climate crisis, health, education, um, everything, because I think that's where the, the solutions and the future is. I don't think it's because when we look at all these systems, they're all optimized for two things, uh, exponential growth and profit. And that literally is not sustainable. That's why we're in this situation. So all of the projects that we're trying to develop, that's the kind of key kernel of, of development, right? Like in Hawaii, we have these ahupua'a systems. Has anybody heard of this? They're super cool. It's our like traditional form of land tenure. And so from the from the Mauka to the top of the mountain to the to the to the water to the to the reef, it's dialectically intertwined. We're, we're we've created this conveyor belt of phytonutrients, um, zero waste, and we plant taro in a certain place and sweet potato in a certain place based on the the, the elevation, right? So we're using gravity to create this dialectically intertwined system. It's, it speaks to the individual valley. It's optimized over time, thousands of years. It's so different than land tenure. Like, look at like Wyoming. It's like a fucking square. It, you know, that's some John Locke Cartesian bullshit. That's not an indigenous way of knowing and land tenure and management where it's completely optimized and perfected and efficient. And I want to do that with every single project we build. That is the impetus. That's the difference. Because when you, you know, when you look at something like I'm picking on Wyoming, which is an incredible place. So not to pick on those guys, but that's not their fault that, mm -hmm. that the way that land was divided up was a square that just happens to feed into a larger land tenure system that's based on capitalism. So, you know, just keeping it real. I'm turning 35, so I'm like tired of bullshit, and, you know. Thank you so much, man. I wish I had uh, been as as uh, coming around to more, so many interesting topics when I was 35, but <laughs> I'm not gonna, uh, so you just make me more jealous now. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I, we are looking for another final question uh, mm -hmm. as we are sort of uh, stretching uh, everyone's schedules. But again, I think uh, everybody agrees that this is more than fascinating. And I personally, I could go on for another two hours of questions <laughs> and, and exchange. This has been really fascinating. But I think there's uh, Pat raising her hand. Please, Pat, go ahead. Yeah, um, I wanted to know how do you broach the ethical questions. You talked about how ethics is really the base of these uh, research projects and how and who broaches the ethical questions because you're part of two worlds, the indigenous world as well as the scientific world with uh, its practices. So mm. if you could just think a little bit about that. It's a great question. I think so. I uh, teach here. I teach. Um, I teach for our undergraduate students. I teach for our doctor students and master students too. And I always like look at my colleagues' syllabus too because I want to compare and I want to like, 
you know, steal the things I like and recombine them with my thing, whatever. And I noticed that there's just this like afterthought about ethics. It's like week 10 of 10, we're going to have the ethics lecture. And so that's super disappointing because that shows that shows our students and what the next generation, what the priority is rather than the way things are taught and you learn things like from the Hawaiian way of, of thinking and knowing that everything starts with the pico, the root is a, is like a, an ethical story. Um, if we talk about Pele um, and her, under, you know, she's the goddess from, from our island that's, you know, the probably the most known, right? The volcano god, right? But it's not mythology. There's all of these embedded questions about geology. There's all these embedded questions about land tenure and responsibility and sustainability and all of these things. So somehow like that has been separated from what the, like it's entangled, right? Like in an indigenous way of, 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 of thinking about it. It's entangled, the ethics, the science, the, the storytelling, the everything, the local, the local complexities of like Hale Mau Mau and Kilauea and whatever. But when we look at these other systems, it's like, and it's so complex that, that many people that don't speak Hawaiian will never in a hundred lifetimes understand that. But for whatever reason, when we look at the way volcanologists interpret that, they'll say things like, oh, you know, the Hawaiians had 70 different ways to talk about lava. And, you know, it's just, it's from our point of view, I think um, that that idea of its, in, its entanglement is important. And that's a lot of the stuff I try to build for our students. So I have students at University of Hawaii. I always teach these classes in the medical school for them. And so I did one on um, biological complexity, natural selection, and, and genetics. And so I started with this chant from called the Kumulipo, which is our origin story. And it starts with darkness. And then, then you get the slime molds. And then you get the corals. And then you get the octopus. And then you get, right? And we're building on evolution and biological complexity. So they get the whole concept of of natural selection from this Hawaiian root, from this chant that Queen Lilio Kalani um, translated into English so that's accessible for, for both directions. And then through that, they learn about all of the other, you know, about A, G, C's and T's and whatever. But uh, so, so, so that's what I'm saying about like, okay, we can either start the conversation with like week 10 ethics, or we can build the educational program through our culture and i can do both at the same time no problem no problem i've been doing it my whole life i just haven't owned it until the last decade or so because i think like what education systems tell like students that aren't from that culture or we don't have the hidden curriculum because our mom and dad didn't do a md or phd or whatever um you you think you have to learn and communicate a certain way when you don't you don't. We should be disrupting all of that stuff because it's not serving everybody. But I guess that's a long-winded wit of response. So, thank you so much, Kiaru. I I agree. And Ashley, if I, if you have another minute for for a question of my my own, uh, I was just wondering, like working on on Arctic issues, but also climate issues, and also on the climate negotiations, also with indigenous groups. Like you talked a lot about sort of like ethics and changing also the the curricula and sort of you know changing the thinking of of uh, in education and research and science. And I, I couldn't agree more. Just wondering about the existing processes as sort of like the international institutions, they are in place, they are long winded and you know really cumbersome, I guess, and especially for many indigenous groups, which are already uh, feel quite challenged in terms of just personal resources. And you know they have you know excellent people, but the you know limited in numbers and also resources to send them to all these conferences and to participate in all of these meetings. Uh, so I was just wondering if, if you maybe have uh, just, just from your experience and you know, hosting uh, your own conference and you're hosting your own exhibitions, you know, maybe some, some word of advice that, that you, know, you can share, like you know, how in the meantime, while we're changing the future <laughs> with the future generations, you know, how to work within the existing systems, if there's anything you, you encountered that enables you know, us and, and you and me and others, you know, to enable others, to empower others, uh, you know, following your example. That would be really inspiring as well. Sorry mm. for asking big question towards no, the No, no, it's a great, <laughs> I mean, that is like the, 
that is like the main source of my frustration at this point in time is going through yeah. all the all of the beer accuracies and ways that we're trying to figure out opportunities to launder all of this money into our communities right i think like just to be honest i think that everyone here understands that that's the like if you get a grant you know the things that make me the most happy are the ways that i i find opportunities to funnel that into like providing this uncle who's a fisherman with diesel um or like and i know you guys are all doing those types of things and i think it, it kind of that's the grassroots aspect of it and then there's the larger institutional stuff so like building up all of these safeguarding and deterrent and counter technologies and those perspectives because if you don't have solutions nobody cares that's what i'm starting to realize because i tried the guilt stuff for a while and i was like damn this isn't working like nobody's giving me money oh man and then you you know you you kind of trans i'm still learning about all this stuff too you guys are probably but i feel like working from the inside is definitely works definitely works rather than like challenging every single institution i mean that money is dirty i would never you know that's never going to help anybody that's not it's like it's it's like what you do with it i guess right. is that cool i don't know i think pragmatism i would say yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. right thank you so much i think you know everyone please join me in another round of applause and thank you so much keolu for taking the time and even a little bit of extra time and making making a work for today. Um, so uh, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure. I would hand over to Victoria for some next steps in the program. Please, Victoria. Yeah, uh, I was doing a big woohoo. Thank you for a totally awesome presentation. Uh, and I, I know I'll be following up with you on a whole bunch of stuff, but I hope that everyone else on this call also is going to follow up because I think there are some pretty awesome opportunities, big questions, but also meaningful ways for everyone to get involved in those solutions. Um, so I hope that there is lots of follow up. Uh, and with this blockbuster of a finish, we have finished our Arctic Winter College. Uh, so just a huge, huge thank you to everyone for spending the first part of 2021 together, learning from 21 incredible speakers about an incredible number of really diverse topics. Uh, we have gone from Arctic greening to indigenous languages. We have gone from maritime disputes to oil spills. We have covered everything in between Queen, and I'm so thankful that everyone has given us two hours of their past 10 weeks to learn together. Um, I have sent out a follow up video for everyone on what our next steps are. Um, and if you have any questions about those, please get in touch with me. Um, I will be organizing monthly happy hour, coffee hours, depending on if you're in Alaska or Russia um, or everywhere in between to continue learning together. Um, so please keep an eye out for those. And uh, hopefully I will see all of you in person for our research coordination network meetings uh, in Alaska, in Stockholm, in DC, in the years to come. Um, so please register for our research coordination network so that you can get stipends to meet in person uh, and become fast real life friends instead of Zoom friends. Um, so with that, Thank you again, everyone.